Today is part three for our lecture on query optimization. Um, it's again, I'm here at my home office. It's just me and the terrier uh, who may or may not be asking questions as we go along. Um, so the, the type of optimizers we've talked about so far uh, have been the sort of classic query optimizers where the query shows up, we parse the SQL, then we run it through the optimizer and we generate a plan before we even begin executing the query. Right? This is how most query uh, optimizers work, right? Obviously you can't run the query unless you have a query plan, so you have to put it through the optimizer. But the challenge is going to be that what we, we think is the best plan during, the, uh, during this optimization phase before we even start running it may actually be incorrect, right? Because there's a, since we can't actually run the query without a plan, there's some assumptions we have to make about what the database and what our environment looks like. But these things can change over time for, for various reasons, right? So the, the physical design of the database can change because the administrator of the application could add and drop indexes or cha change the partitioning scheme. The, uh, the database itself could get modified. People could insert tuples or delete tuples and that could change the distribution of values for our columns. If we're invoking our queries as prepared statements, then the, uh, the behavior of the query uh, for one set of parameters might be different for another set of parameters. And then of course, every time you run uh, analyze or whatever the command is in our database system to recollect the statistics that we use in our cost models, every time we, we update them, then the decisions we'll make in our optimizer could be, could be entirely different. So, the sort of focus today is sort of understand like how can we potentially uh, improve our optimizers, uh, the efficacy of or the the quality of the plans that we're generating by maybe relaxing this requirement that we that we only generate a plan or only revisit our assumptions, um, or we never revisit our assumptions once we generate the plan at the beginning. So to do this, we want to understand a little bit what uh, to, uh, what a bad query plan looks like or why query plans. Uh, can be considered bad and then end up with uh, less than optimal performance. So we'll cover this more on Wednesday when we discuss uh, cost models. But in general, I say the high level, the biggest problem we're always going to have is the, we're going to get the join orders incorrect. Joins are almost always the most expensive thing we're going to execute in a analytical workload. And so if we get the ordering incorrect, uh, that can get, lead to, to poor performance. And the reason why we're going to make uh, select incorrect ordering is because we're going to have inaccurate cardinality estimations, meaning we think that our join is going to produce x number of tuples, but it's really going to be you know x times y or some, you know some 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 larger multiple than what we thought was going to happen. Again, we'll discuss why this occurs more in, in the next lecture, but this 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 issue is going to be a reoccurring theme that we're going to have to overcome, and today's discussion is sort of see um, techniques to do this. So, but since we know things are going to go bad, like we just know, we can just assume that our, our cost model is going to be inaccurate, our optimizer is going to make bad decisions, then ideally if we can detect how bad our query plan is once we start running it, then we can make a decision to adapt the plan to, count, to modify potentially to, to account for these differences and what we're seeing in the real data versus what we assume we're going to see. And then we can then try to convert our plan into, uh, into something that's closer to the optimal plan. So what I mean like that is, say we have a simple query like this. It's a four-way join between eight tables A, B, C, and D. Um, and then we just have a simple where clause for uh, the B and D tables. So Let's say that we run this query through our query optimizer and we generate this plan, right? It's a bunch of hash joins and, and nothing but sequential scans. But let's say that uh, when, we, when we generate this plan for this particular join, we estimated the cardinality of that operator to be 1,000, right? This is, this is a, a, an arbitrary number that I'm using for this illustration. Right? The cardinality is the number of tuples that this operator will emit. But let's say when we actually start to run it, we see that we're, we're actually generating 100,000 tuples. So our 
uh, actual cardinality is two orders of magnitude greater than the estimate one. So the question we're trying to deal with today is if we knew what the just true cardinality was before we started executing it, um, I'm sorry, while we're executing it, then could we change some aspect of this query plan to get us closer to uh, a more optimal plan, right? Could we change the join ordering? Will we want to choose a different algorithm to do our join? Will we want to change maybe the access methods that come below the join uh, to use maybe an index or a different, different type of scam? So this is sort of what we're focusing on today is how to then maybe adapt this, this kind of plan when we know something about the, what the data looks like once we start running it. So the, the high level idea again is that we want to be able to execute, uh, estimate the behavior of a plan uh, to, in order to determine, you know, ex estimate the behavior of a plan to determine its quality relative to other plans. This is what the cost model is doing. But the tricky thing is going to be back here, before I started executing this, I had to derive this cardinality from, the, from my, my, my statistics that I had maintaining in my catalog about what my table looks like or what, what, the, you know, what these two tables look like when, when you join them together. So these stats are going to be based on histograms and possibly samples that we, we're collecting from the data. We can also make decisions about uh, what the hardware looks like, what kind of cache sizes we have, and what kind of maybe algorithm we want to use, uh, what other queries are running at the same time. Like the cost model stuff we'll cover next class, but the main idea to think about is what we're talking about today is before we run the query, we, we only have an estimation of what the data looks like and how our query will, will perform. And if we get that wrong, we want to then try to be able to correct ourselves. So the technique we're talking about today is called adaptive query optimization. It's sometimes called in the research liter literature adaptive query processing, right? They're, they're essentially synonymous. And it's everything I said so far. The idea is that this technique is going to allow the database system to modify the query plan for a query um, to better fit what the actual underlying data looks like. And we can be modifying the, for the query plan by just generating an entirely new query plan, like throwing away the old one and starting over. Or we could try to modify a subset of the query plan, uh, of our query plan by introducing new sort of sub plans or almost like a pipeline um, at different points where we have to materialize tuple, where we could potentially switch from you know, one plan strategy to, to another. And the, this one here, you basically go back to the optimizer and start over. This one here is that you can try to have the optimizer only do, uh, only replan a portion of it or provide these alternative strategies uh, at the beginning. So the main, the main sort of takeaway approach, what we're doing here is that rather than just relying on our statistical models that are estimations or approximations of what the data looks like, we're trying to use the data we've collected while we actually execute the query to then help us make a decision about what the right plan should be for our particular query, right? And this data we're gonna collect is, could be used for helping our current query or merge it, we can merge it back into the statistics we've collected through our analyze operation and have it be used for other queries. So again, we'll cover the various ways you have to do this, but when you think about what a query actually is doing, you know, or what Analyze does, Analyze is just doing a sequential scan to compute some statistical models about what the, the data looks like. And so the, if we're doing the sequential scan on, on a table, that's essentially the same thing as Analyze. And so rather than just evaluating predicates or using the, you know, the tuples as we scan them to uh, generate the result we need for that particular query, we can piggyback, piggyback off, of those, uh, off of that scan operator and sort of main, or maintain or update our, our and update our sort of these statistical models with new information. And the question here is whether we just update that models for ourselves to make our query go better, or can we can share this with other queries or in, in the, the global catalog, and now other queries can benefit from, uh, from the, the data we've collected from this. All right, so there's sort of three broad categories that I wanna cover uh, using a AQO or adaptive query optimization. One is that uh, we can use AQO to benefit future invocations of our query. The second approach is to try to make our current invocation of our query better. 
And then the last one would be, um, well, this is like helping your current query. This is also helping your current query. But this one would be sort of starting over from scratch and just running through the optimizer all over again. This would be adding uh, locations in the query plan that allow you to change one strategy for, versus, you know, switch on one strategy to the next with, again, out having to go back to, to the optimizer. So we'll go through each of these one by one. So the sort of the most simplest form of adaptive query optimization is, as I said, where as we execute our query, we also collect some information about what the data looks like and then we can uh, use that information to, to decide whether our query is wrong and want to replan it, or we could then merge that back into the, uh, the sort of the global catalog. Again, when you think about this, right, what is the optimizer actually doing? You have a bunch of histograms or statistical models about what your, your, your attributes look like. So for a given predicate in your where clause, you want to estimate the selectivity of that predicate, because that'll determine how many tuples your scan will emit. And you can use that to make decisions about you know, join orderings and other things above in the query plan. So the, as you execute the scan, if you, if you, you know, you actually know the true selectivity because you're applying the predicate on the tuples and you know the number, the, the, the number of tuples or percentage of the tuples are going to match. So if you then determine that the cost model estimated my selectivity was 1%, but when I run the real query and I, I run the query and actually do the, the evaluation of the predicate, my selectivity is 99% then I wanted to use that information to help me decide whether to replan my query or, or that future queries come along, they can, uh, you know, exploit the knowledge that, I, that I've gained. So again, the, the, the one approach is to try to again, fix my current query, or the other one is just merging it back into the, uh, into the overall um, uh, the statistical catalog, uh, models in, in the catalog so that I can then help f queries in the future. So the most basic approach to do this is called reversion based plan correction. Um, and the idea here is, as I said, is just every single time I invoke a query, I keep track of what query plan I, I generated for it. I keep track of the cost estimations I had for it. And then the, I'll have all my metrics of what, what happened when actually when I ran it, right? How many, how many tuples I selected and how much CPU or memory that I used. And I'm going to maintain this history inside the database itself. So you'll see this in like the commercial systems, like, uh, in DB2, Oracle, and, uh, and SQL Server, they have this uh, built-in repository um, of the history of every single query that ever got invoked. And they can use that information to help decide how to do query planning in the future. So let's say that we have a prepared statement or we have a query that, that's being invoked all the time and we have a cache query plan. So rather than maybe running through the optimizer every single time, we can just use the, 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 the cache query plan that we've already generated from previous invocations. So if now there's a change in our, in, uh, in the, you know, the statistics or something about the database, that physical design that changes, and we recognize that we maybe want to, for this particular query we keep invoking, we want to run it back through the optimizer and see if we generate, see if we generate a new plan. But then when we run that new plan for this query, if we see that the performance of the query is worse than the old plan that we had before, then we just want to revert back to it, right? If there's a regression in the performance, we switch back to the plan that we know actually performed better for us, despite the change in the, other, in the physical design or the statistical models. So we use that simple query example that I had before, right, the four-way join. Say again, this is my original plan, and I'm doing nothing but sequential scans and a hash join, and say that my estimated cost is 1,000, and my cost estimation is pretty good, so my actual cost actually matches up. Right, these are just synthetic numbers here. So I'm going to store in my execution history for my database system that I generated for this query, I generated this plan, and when I ran it, I had this cost. And this is just uh, another database or another table in, in my database system, right? You're sort of eating your own dog food. Rather than having an auxiliary store, th this is just another table that you, re you record this information. All right, so now let's say there's a, there's a change in our database design. Say the DBA comes along and adds two indexes on the B table and the D table, which we're using in, in our where clause. So now when we invoke the same query again, we would recognize that the design of the database has changed in such a way where we may now want to reconsider 
uh, the query plan for this particular query, right? So this query touches b.val and d.val. Well, I, I just happen to create indexes on those columns. So I want to run this through my optimizer again and see what plan I get. And let's say now for the new plan, it's completely different. So now we're, instead of running hash joins, we're running index nested loop joins. And we're doing an index scan on b on d, which we can now do because we have an index on that, which we didn't have before. And so now we're going to pick this plan for our query because the, est the estimated cost is 800, which is less than the estimated cost that we had over here. But when we actually run it for whatever reason that we, that we don't care about at this point, uh, the actual cost is, is 1200. Right? This could be that the, you know, we, we incorrectly estimated that the cost of these nested loop joins would be cheaper than the hash joins. So we, we picked a nested loop joins. So just as before, it's when we actually put this, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that's not Corona. Um, if we actually now put this in our, in our extra history, we would recognize that the, uh, for this plan here, uh, again, it performed worse than this other one here. So the next time we invoke it, we want to make sure that we, we, we use this plan. We want to revert back to the one that we know uh, performed better. So for this approach here, uh, this is something that Microsoft has had in SQL Server, and I think Oracle has, has something similar in, in, since maybe 2012, 2013. But this is pretty coarse grain, right? This is pretty brain dead heuristic. It's basically saying, oh, this query plan is bad. Let me just switch back to this one, right? So, so it's like an all or nothing thing. So the paper you guys are assigned reading from Microsoft is called plan stitching. And the, the high level idea is exactly the same, where if we recognize that our query is running slower than query plans we saw in the past, rather than potentially uh, just throwing away the entire query plan, the, the new query plan, and reverting back to the old one, maybe there are elements or aspects or subplans within the newer plan we actually wouldn't want to retain because, and then that, that'll, that'll, that'll help us lead us toward, towards a, a better plan, a more optimal plan, right? And the other thing about plan stitch as well is that the subplans you're going to borrow from other queries don't need to be actually from the same query. Like in this case here, I can only reuse the plan uh, in the simplest form. I can only swap between plans if they're running on the exact same query. But with plan stitch, because I can excise out sub plans or portions of the query plan, as long as I know that they're logically equivalent, I can take bits and pieces from, from other queries, all right? The other interesting thing too is that if there is a change in the physical design where a new plan, query plan becomes invalid, meaning like it defined that it wanted to do index scan, but then, then I dropped that index, rather than just getting thrown away the entire query, uh, the query plan in its entirety, I can maybe again pull out pieces of it, right? So the basic approach they're gonna use is, or the, the, the way they're gonna generate these, these stitched plans is a dynamic programming uh, search method using a bottom-up approach where you just, uh, you check to see from going from one level to the next in the same way we, we do with system R, going one, one node to the next, you pick which, 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 which um, subplan is, is the best. And then once you reach the end goal, you, you, you find the, the cheapest path. So this means that it's not guaranteed to find a better plan uh, than the best plan you have so far. And it is not guaranteed to always produce a valid plan. Um, and, but there's some basic heuristics they use to make sure that happens. Right, so going back to our example here, right, say that um, this is our new plan and say it was working just fine, right? Like it was actually faster, so we always wanna use this. But now if I come along and I drop one of the indexes that I'm using, this plan now becomes invalid uh, and under just sort of coarse grain reversion, I can't reuse it, but with plan stitching, I actually want to figure out what components of this subplan or the query plan here that I may want to use in the new plan. Even though overall it's invalid, there's still portions that are that are still usable. So in this case there, say this portion of the subplan, uh, the, the subplan of this of part of the query, the execution cost is 600, and we would know this because we can keep track of every all the the the, the, the actual runtime cost of all the operators in our in our query. And for this one here, this subplan over here has a cost of 150. So now if I combine these together into a stitch plan, the total cost of this case would be uh, 750. Whereas before, if I didn't run this, it was 1,000. So again, the idea is that we want to be able to 
borrow bits and pieces of different query plans to end up and help us produce the a more optimal plan. And this is being done separately from the, the regular optimizer. In the case of Microsoft's uh, SQL Server, they're running Cascade, so they're actually doing a top-down search. But this is sort of this auxiliary search that's running on the side that uh, in the background, it tries to find a plans it can stitch together. So let's talk about how, how they actually do this. The, uh, the first step is you need to identify which portions or which, which subplans in our queries uh, are logically equivalent. Right, we talked about this before under uh, with cascades when we had when we had multi group multi expression groups. Right, we want to know that the 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 output of a given subplan is is the same or equivalent to another subplan. Right, and again, we, we have to rely on our the the rules of relational algebra to recognize which operations can be commutative or or associative. Uh, so in this case here, this portion of the subplan. Just a, the output is the A join B join C. This portion of, of another subplan is the output is C join B join A. But since joins, these inner joins here are commutative, we know that these are, are logically equivalent. Now, as I said, the uh, well, one, one challenge with this is that uh, determining whether any arbitrary logical expressions or, or logical subplans are, are equivalent has been shown to be undecidable, meaning like it, it, the, the question is like, are these two subplans logically equivalent? It's, it's a yes or no answer, uh, but there's no algorithm that exists, uh, has been proven, that can, can, can be guaranteed to always give the correct answer. So in the plan stitch phase, they're gonna rely on some additional heuristics to identify things like, oh, I know that these two subplans are accessing different tables, so therefore they can't be logically equivalent. Right? You obviously can do more complicated things. Um, the optimizer itself in, in SQL Server also has those kind of checks in place. Um, and so they, they rely on that as well. So they have their own heuristics to prune things that can never be logically equivalent. And they rely on the SQL Server optimizer to identify that uh, the, 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 the logical subplan you're trying to mash together or the, the subplane trying to mash together in the, in the stitch plan is, is invalid. So the heuristics are providing them with this sort of sweet spot balance between the difficulty in, in the implementation, right? It's a bunch of, bunch of enforcer rules, um, the accuracy of, of, the, of, the, of the determination, whether they're equivalent, and then the performance, right? It's not an exhaustive search, an exhaustive evaluation of, of all possible inputs to the different subplans. It's just rules based on the relational algebra. All right, so now once we identify that we have uh, a bunch of equivalent uh, subplans, we want to figure out, we want to sort of combine them together into one giant query plan that where you're going to add some additional uh, operators to determine that you can have branches to go down different, you know, different paths in the subplan. So this is how they're going to encode the, 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 all the different combinations of the subplans for, that you could stitch together. So the way this is going to work is they're going to introduce this new OR operator, which is not actually being used for execution. This is just something for, for the search. And the, the OR basically indicates that the subplans below it are logically equivalent. So we could choose either path. So starting from the, from the top, we have, an, we have an OR clause at the very beginning. Um, and then we have the two, for this particular query, we have the either doing the hash join or the or the nested loop join. And again, these are logically equivalent because this is A join B join C join D, and this is C join B join A join D, and those are, and the joins are commutative, so these, therefore these are logically equivalent. So then now, say go down, uh, we're gonna go like a death first search, going down on this side. Uh, for this one here, same thing, we can do the hash join on A and B followed by C. This is the nested loop join on C followed by C join B join A. Again, these are logically equivalent, so that's why we can have the OR clause, we can choose either one. And then we're just gonna keep going down until we get to our leaf node uh, in the sequential scan. And then here we don't see, we don't, there's another option for us uh, in, in this portion of the query plan because the one we stitched from just, you know, only had, ha only had a hash join. So now in this case here for the hash join at A, we can do a sequential scan as we saw in the first plan or we can do the index scan on B because uh, that came from the second plan. And so we have an OR operator to express that. Going back up here, we can only do a sequential scan on C, so that's a straight path. Going back up here for the nested loop join, 
Uh, it can, you know, only thing we can do below it is another nested loop join. And then for this, we can either do a sequential scan on A, or again, for, for B, we can either do the sequential scan or the index scan. Going back up here for the hash join, again, we, that's feeding, uh, a sequential scan on D feeding in, and then we just complete the, uh, the rest of the tree like this. So this is a, a bit more simplified version of what they showed in the paper, but uh, you know, these are actually the, the, the possible options you can have. Um, and so what I think, remember in the paper, what they talked about is that this approach and doing the search within this to find a stitch plan, they're able to stitch about 75 to almost 100% of, of all the plans together for the, for the workloads that, that they looked at. All right, so now that we've encoded our search space, we actually want to do our search. And this is just starting from the bottom and going up in the same way we did with the system R dynamic uh, programming search, where we just, for every single leaf node, we start off with uh, figuring out what the cost is for going to uh, the next operator. We pick which one is the best. And then once we complete all the, we do the search for all the nodes at our current level, we then go up to the next level and, and complete this process. All right, so let's say we start with the sequential scan on A. It only has one option first, which is just the, um, Oh, it has, it's either a hash join on A, B, or, uh, or the, the, the nested, nested loop over here. Say the hash join is cheaper, so we pick that. Now we do a sequential scan on B. This has an OR operator. All right, so this is either doing a hash join or the nested loop join. And let's say the hash join is cheaper, so we pick that. Now we do this for uh, the index scan on B. Again, there's an OR, OR operator. We need the hash join and the nested loop join. And so because we have an index, the nested loop join actually would be cheaper here. So we would pick that. And we just keep going down the line and do this for all our leaf nodes. And then we're done, we go up to the next level. And then again, now we have a cost for all these paths uh, leading up and we just pick which one is, is the cheapest for us. And then we reconstruct the, the, the we, we construct the stitch plan that way, all right? So again, I think this is an interesting uh, approach. I don't think Microsoft is actually running this in production. Like this was a research paper that was published in Sigmod. Um, I don't know of any other system that's doing something similar like this. I, from an engineering standpoint, the fact that you have to run this separately from the, uh, from the query optimizer um, and sort of have separate infrastructure for that. Terry, what are you doing? Um, Right, so rather than having a separate, you know, separate sort of search infrastructure, if this is integrated into the query optimizer like uh, component itself, uh, I think this would be a really interesting approach. So there's another system that does something similar to this plan stitching, uh, but they're actually working on a sort of a, a, sort of a cogen level rather than like a physical query plan level. So Amazon has their Redshift uh, data warehouse uh, service. Um, and it's based on Par Excel, and they use actually a uh, they do a, it's a transpilation engine. So the database system for a given physical plan generates C plus plus code or C code, which they then compile, and then they run you know they they invoke the the shared object that, that comes out of the compiler, and then that's how they do uh, query compilation. So the obviously the most expensive part of uh, you know Cogen engine is is the compilation, right? In their case, they're actually forking GCC or whatever compiler they're using to actually generate the, the machine code. Um, so they wanna try to avoid that for every single query. So what they can do is uh, they say you're doing, uh, you, want, you wanna compile the scan on B where you wanna see what b.val equals some, some input parameter. So they'll cogen that piece, run it through the compiler that generates x86 code, um, and then they'll go ahead and cache it. And then now anytime you re-invoke this, this query, uh, you know you can just reuse the compiled version of the scan on B. But similar to plan stitching, what they can also do is they can recognize that if you have another query with the same kind of predicate, b.val equals, uh, you know, equals some parameter, it'll cogen the exact same thing. So rather than recompiling it, which is again the expensive part, they can identify that they have a cache uh, plan fragment uh, of, of for this, this, this scan here, and they can reuse that. And so they actually can do this uh, across all possible, or across all their customers. So like this, you know, the scan on a table to do one, you know, something equals something on a you know, bar chart field, that's gonna be the same from one table to the next because it's a column, so you're just ripping through the column. So they can actually share these little fragments 
uh, and stitch these query, physical query plans or the compiled query plans together from all possible you know, customers. So now for a given query that they've never seen before, if it has the same pattern of access methods and joins and other things as queries from another customer, they just pull from the cogent cache and stitch together. So that's kind of cool. All right, so there, another interesting system to talk about is uh, IBM's Leo, the learning optimizer. And so this is an example of where you have a feedback loop being used to uh, improve the, the, the accuracy of the cost models in the system. Right, so the idea is that, uh, again, if I, I keep track of what the, my cost model estimates were when I, when I generated the query plan, and then when I run it, if I, if I recognize that those estimates are way off, I start recording information about what I'm seeing in the real data. And then when my query completes, I return the result back to the, the user or the application that requested the, request the query. But I also go update my cost model statistics uh, with the new information that I've collected. Um, so IBM's Leo was, is actually shipped in production in DB2 today. Um, but this is one of the, the, the earliest examples of a commercial system do, uh, applying one of these uh, adaptive query uh, processing techniques. All right, so the, the plan stitching stuff that we talked about or the reversion stuff is about fixing future invocations of a query uh, to improve them based on the, the results that I'm seeing when I, when I actually execute my query. But now we want to talk about how do we fix my query. Like if, if I invoke my SQL query and I determine that I have a bad plan, what do I do? Right? How, how can I fix that? Because I don't want to wait for the, the next invocation. I want to fix the one I have right now. So I'm calling this the replanning the current invocation. Again, the idea is that if I've determined that the observed behavior of the query plan as I'm executing it is way off or, or, or divergent from what the estimated behavior was that the cost models uh, produced, then I can decide to potentially either stop the query uh, and go back and generate a new plan, or I can decide to maybe how much smile. Um, uh, recognize that I've already produced some work for me uh, and keep that portion of the data that I've already processed and then re return back to the optimizer and ask it to just, just to generate a sub plan. So again, it's either just start from scratch and you know you, you decide that continuing with the same query plan that I have now is going to be worse than just starting over. Um, obviously, if you're at the last tool, the, the last operator, then it's a bad idea. You just let it finish. So striking the right balance of this is difficult. And then the other approach is determining that, well, I'm doing 100 joins and I've already done one of them. Let me keep that one that I have because uh, that was expensive and then I'll replan the ordering for the other 99. Again, the whole idea here is that you're going back to the optimizer and saying, hey, generate, generate me a new plan. So let me give an uh, example that does something sort of similar to like this. Um, so this is from Apache QuickStep. QuickStep was, or is a, uh, embedded analytical engine, sort of similar to DuckDB, uh, but I don't think it's supported SQL. It came out of University of Wisconsin and then it's been, um, it's been turned over to the Apache Foundation. I think it's been kicked out of the incubator program because I don't think they've updated it recently. I, I don't know what's going on with, uh, with Jignesh and his team, um, but I haven't really seen any updates in a while. But they had this really interesting approach called look ahead information passing, where I can do some work at the beginning of my query and pass that along to other operators or other portions of my query plan and help me make a decision about uh, what the right ordering is for, for things up ahead. So for this example, say we have uh, uh, a simple data that has three tables. And so this would be a star schema. So this, this, this approach only works for star schema. We have a, a fact table in the middle and then you have dimension tables coming out of it, right? So it's not for arbitrary uh, star schemas or ar arbitrary like tree tree based schemas. So the way this is going to work is, uh, say this is my SQL query like this. I'm doing a three way join between the fact table and the two dimension tables. So what I'm going to do is, before I begin the uh, before I start scanning the the fact table and start computing the hash table hash tables for my join, I'm going to scan through the dimension tables and generate a bloom filter. We saw this similar technique being used when we talked about joins, right? This, this idea came from VectorWise that you can generate a balloon filter and then pass it along to, uh, to the other side of the query plan so, so that um, you maybe avoid a hash table probe. 
and let me say this. So the joins are going to be on the dimension tables. The, these are going to generate the hash tables and the fact table is just going to do a probe. So I want to generate the bloom filter and then check the bloom filter to see whether the key I'm looking for can even exist in the hash table, which is cheaper than doing the, the hash table probe. But what we're going to do differently here is that we're actually going to pass these bloom filters. And when we pass it over here to the fact table, we're going to start, uh, do some sampling to determine the selectivity of the, of the, of the different of bloom filters for these different tables. And then if we determine that, well, the second, second table here, the second dimension table is actually going to be more selective than the first one, then I, I want to reshuffle the, um, reshuffle my joins so that I do the, the probe on this hash table first, because I'm going to end up throwing away more tuples. And we can do this before we actually even start running anything because we've already built the hash tables. We generate the bloom filter and we can make, we can make the decision before we start scanning and doing the probe. So I, I think this is a really interesting idea. As far as I know, quick step is the only one that does this. And I, I don't know whether it actually made it into the open source version. All right. The last, uh, adaptive query optimization techniques, uh, sort of or category you want to talk about is, uh, what I call sort of plan pivot points. And the idea here is that, uh, we want to introduce additional sub plans in our query and then have a, uh, have a, a sort of special synthetic operator that we put into our query plan that allows us to pivot or switch which query, you know, which path in that query plan we want to do. And the idea here is that we can put conditions in our in the switch operator or the, the change plan operator that if we determine that our data looks one way, we'll go down one path. If it looks another way, we'll, we'll go down another uh, the other path. Um, it doesn't have to be two, it can be multiple ones. So the sort of two most famous techniques for doing this are parametric optimization and proactive reoptimization. Again, at a high level, they're gonna work exactly the same way. It's just the sophistication of their technique is slightly different. So parametric optimization was actually developed in the late 1980s and uh, in 1989. This actually came out of the Volcano project. Again, the same one that does the Volcano uh, query optimizer, the Volcano iterator model. They also did early work on adaptive query optimization, which is, again, as I'm saying, that work is very influential. So again, as I said, the idea is that for each pipeline in a query that we think uh, that there's different alternatives we could have that would make a big performance difference, we'll generate different sub plans for them. And then now in our query, we'll have this choose plan operator that basically has kind of an if clause that says, if the cardinality of the operator below me looks one way or it's of a certain size, then I want to choose the first plan. If it looks another way, then I'll choose this other plan. Right? And in this case here, if I know that my data is really small, then maybe I want to do a nested loop join because that's going to be cheaper than having to build a hash table and probe it. Um, but if my data is really big, then I maybe want to build a hash join, right? Or do, do the hash join. So again, I think this is, this is actually an interesting idea. Of course, obviously the, the tricky thing is determining what this conditional, uh, you know, this condition should be. Um, and you know, there's, it's sort of, sort of through trial and error as you develop the thing. And it's actually very dependent also on the, on, on the hardware. But the nice thing about this is like, there's nothing, we, we end up like not having to go back to the optimizer and sort of replan everything. Um, the, and we don't throw away any of the data that we've collected, right? So the, we do this hash join and then we just determine whether we want to go down one path versus an, another. A more recent sophisticated approach to this is called proactive reoptimization. And this is actually combining the ability to, to go back to the optimizer and generate a new plan, as well as to, to tweak it in the same way we saw in, in the previous example. So they actually can do both. And so at a high level, it works like this. So query shows up, we generate through the optimizer, and so we'll generate different, uh, different switchable plans, just like before, but we're also gonna now gonna generate bounding boxes that allow us to uh, determine whether the assumptions that we're making and our decisions about whether to go down one path versus another are actually going to match up with reality, right? It's basically trying to uh, put a balance on the uncertainty we're seeing in the data as, as we run. So now we start executing the query. And just like before in, in Leo and other techniques, we execute the query, collect statistics about the data that we're seeing for a particular query. And then we can switch the query plan just as we saw before 
if we determine that you know one plan path might be better than another but then if we also determine based on our if we're sort of exceeding our estimations in our in our bounding box thresholds if we see that we're way out of you know way out of um whack and our estimations are way off then we just go back and can re-optimize and then you can determine whether to, to pin the portions of the query plan that you've already executed because you know they're expensive or you can just say throw everything away and, and start over so uh, this is sort of gonna a crash course on adaptive query optimization. Um, the I actually really like this these techniques, um, and there's for obvious reasons, right? Like it doesn't rely on getting it right the very beginning. Like you can you can sort of correct yourself as 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 you're actually running the query. Um, so we'll, again, we'll see in the next class when we talk about cost models of how bad things can actually get. Um, but the way you actually need to implement this is super important. That it's just not you know, you don't want to implement your optimizer and your execution engine completely separately from each other. It's sort of a symbiotic relationship where you have to know what kind of strategies could be employed by the execution engine and the optimizer in terms of like switching paths and throwing away intermediate results or not. And then you build your optimizer or you build the optimizer around what your execution engine can, can actually do. Um, so for this reason, I think like the... Uh, I think applying this technique for, or using this technique with sort of this uh, optimizer as a service like Orca or Calcite uh, could actually be tricky because there's different approaches for how you can actually support uh, adaptive query execution in, in, in the system itself. So the, in addition to having sort of more robust or more, uh, more sophisticated query optimizers, all you know versus the open source one open source systems all the major database vendors now support this uh within the last actually mostly in the last three or four years like db2 had this leo thing in the early 2000s um but really in the last three years both oracle and sql server and now teradata also include the ability to do adaptive query optimization but to the best of my knowledge postgres and mysql uh simply can't do this and none of this sort of the newer uh, open source systems that have come around in the last decade support anything like this. So, all right. So again, this was just sort of to show you that you don't have to build the optimizer the way we described it, where you sort of plan once and run it. There are techniques to actually modify the query while it's running and then get feedback from execution and put it into the system. Tier, what the f are you doing? All right, sorry. Um, so next class, we'll then start discussing how, uh, how cost models work uh, and we'll see actually why they're so bad, okay? All right, guys, uh, wash your hands. Bank it in the side pocket. What is this? Some old bullshit. Hey, yo, hey, yo. What? Took a sip and had to spit because I ain't with that beer called the OE because I'm OG. Ice Cube down with the STI. You looked and it was gone. Grab me a 40 just to get my buzz on because I needed just a little more kick. Hook like a fish after just one sip. Yo. Put it to my lips and rip the top off. A ball just dropped off because ain't eyes hopped off and my hood won't be the same. Ice Cube, take a say I to the brain. Yeah.